life into a Singapore Business Society website. So I'm just making sure that it works, right? Uh, it's an interesting day for, for, uh, for us uh, uh, from the perspective that we have actually Rob, uh, Robbie here, right? Uh, Robbie is actually on vacation. <laughs> so so uh, true favors, right? We managed to get him, right, to speak here in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, um, he has an interesting uh, 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 background, right? Science and uh, economics, economics in, in Japanese from, from Cambridge, and then a Japanese history uh, as a first degree, right? Yeah. Master's in Comp Science. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he is actually with uh, uh, KPMG now, formerly investment banker, uh, IBM on the research side, and he is actually looking at uh, entrepreneurism from the UK perspective, right? And he's actually quite uh, uh, well versed in. I think as an exchange, I promise him that if he needs information on Singapore entrepreneur, we'll send to him, right? So, so that he can speak today on, on Bitcoin, right? Um, today we're not going to have a second session because uh, his presentation will be 35 minutes, and I'll try to make it as open as possible uh, for you guys to ask as many questions as possible. Yeah. If we finish early, never mind. I hope pizza arrives and we can have pizza uh, after that, right? So, Chief, without further ado, I will pass it to Ravi, right, uh, to give us a uh, understanding of what Bitcoin is all about. Thank, thank you very much, Robbie. Thank you. Right, hello everyone, and thank you for letting me speak. I know it's the middle of Wednesday, the middle of the week, um, so Jack, I think it's going to lift our spirits to Pizza later, and you're stuck with me before Pizza, so I'll try and make this as, as painless as possible. Now, just before I start, just by a show of hands, out of interest, um, how many people in the last week have done some online shopping? Okay, the last month. No ladies, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So a, re a reasonable amount. Yeah. Um, I think in Singapore it's probably a bit less than, than we have in the UK. I think we have in America. Um, how many people use online banking? Okay, so about half the room, a little bit more than half the room. How many people have used Bitcoin? Not popular here. Not popular here. No one. No one. Right. That's absolutely fine. That's fine. So today, we're going to cover three questions. First of all, why does Bitcoin exist? What's the need for cryptocurrency? Um, and to answer that, we're going to talk about the history of money, the history of currency, going back thousands and thousands of years. Second of all, how does Bitcoin work? So how does Bitcoin address the problems we've got in currency at the moment? And to answer that, we're going to cover a range of topics. We're going to talk about distributed computing, Third of all, we're going to talk about what are the implications of all this. So what are the pros and cons of Bitcoin? Why do people use it? And more interesting for me, what about the underlying technology, in particular blockchain? So blockchain, we'll spend a lot about. There are many other uses of blockchain beyond Bitcoin, and we'll go into some of those. So we're going to dive straight in to our first question. Why does Bitcoin exist? And to answer this, we need to understand a little bit more about money and about history of currency. So, Early forms of money were what we called commodity currencies, things that had intrinsic value, things like gold, things like salt. We'll talk about a few of these in a moment. And they were things that existed in the real world. And what that means is the supply of them is limited. There's only so much gold in the world. You have to go and mine it. It's actually quite difficult to get to. Now, there are many problems with commodity currencies, but they did have some benefits. And some of those benefits Over time, we've got rid of commodity currencies. We don't go around with gold coins in our pocket. And we've replaced them by fiat currencies. Fiat currency, I've got an example here, 10 pound British note, it's just paper money. And the difference between fiat currency and commodity currency is a fiat currency is just issued by a central bank. It has value because the government says it has value. There's no intrinsic value, it's not mine, it's nothing in the real world. It is just a printed piece of paper. And we all agree to share these things that we call money. And fiat currencies are great. There are many, many benefits of fiat currencies, but there are also some problems. Uh, there are two problems, actually. One is there are some problems inherent in fiat currency. We'll talk about those, and Bitcoin overcomes many of those. And the second problem is when you put a fiat currency online, then you get some really interesting problems around fraud, um, around transaction costs, and Bitcoin addresses many of those. 
So let's dive into the history of money and technology trouble. I'm going to start with commodity currencies. So some of you, if you like geography, if you like archaeology, you might have seen this picture before. Earlier this year, in Europe, um, architects, uh, archaeologists, I think is one, discovered um, these salt mines in Provadia in Bulgaria. And this is thought to be the first ever settlement in Europe by humans, the first permanent settlement. And unlike other settlements we've found from later in history, instead of having wooden fences around them and wooden walls, this was constructed of stone, really thick stone actually, which is really hard to get to. And the reason it was constructed of stone is because it was guarding one of the most precious qualities of the time, salt. Salt is really useful. It preserves meats. If you're a merchant, if you're a traveller, you need salt to stay alive to keep your food fresh. So, Provadia became a, a commerce centre for salt. And salt was used six and a half thousand years ago. It was used right up to the 14th century in China. When Marco Polo travelled to China, he talked about seeing um, great salt bricks being printed with the emperor's seal. And instead of exchanging bars of gold, they exchanged bars exchange of salt. Salt was the currency of the day. Moving forward to about four and a half thousand years, a more common commodity currency you'll be aware of is gold. And gold's been used for thousands and thousands of years. Um, I just picked this from the Roman era. This is one of uh, Emperor Hadrian's gold coins. Emperor Hadrian is my favourite Roman emperor because he built the wall between England and Scotland. And it's still there today. It's beautiful to walk along. Highly recommend it. But the really interesting thing is the Romans didn't just use gold. So the Roman warriors who guarded that wall, as well as being paid in gold and land, they also got little packages of salt. It was called their salarium. That's the Roman word for the Greek, so the Latin word for salt. And guess what? That's where we get the word salary from today. So many different kinds of commodities, but they have to be used at the same time. I'm going to fast forward a thousand years into the future from then. This is a rice boat from Yam. Believe it or not, this is the first attempt at making a Bitcoin. So it doesn't look like a Bitcoin. It doesn't look like much. But the people of Yam, they didn't have limestone on their island. So when they explored, they explored the other islands around them, which is currently Micronesia, they discovered this weird stone, limestone. They thought it was valuable in the same way we think gold's valuable. It's a rare commodity. So they decided, for reasons unknown to us, to carve out giant wheels of this stone. And some of these are 12 foot in diameter. So that's about six foot, my old span. So double that, imagine a wheel that size, enormous. Some of these took 100 men to move. And they would carve these out, they would roll them all the way back um, on boats to the island of Yap, and they would plonk them in front of their houses and on the streets of the village, and that was their currency. So, I have one of these stones in front of my house, that's my currency. How do you spend it? can't walk down to the market with this thing, you need a hundred people to move it. So the way you spent it was actually quite simple. I'd walk down to the market and I would go, Chap, I want to buy your crop from you. And in return for your crop, I'll give you the stone outside my house. And let me just tell you a bit about that stone. The stone was mined ten years ago over there. Before me it was owned by this person, before him it was owned by this person. Chap, this stone is now yours. Everyone, you hear that? And it would enter the common language history of the, the Yap community. And because those transactions were remembered and recorded in the history, we all now know that Chap owns that stone. And that's really interesting because it means you don't actually need the stones. Once a stone was being transported across a river and there was an accident, it fell through the river onto the riverbed and it was completely irrecoverable. But everyone on the island agreed, the stone's still there, so why don't we keep transacting? So that stone was still used as currency right up to the start of the 20th century. <coughs> and in fact, yap stones, rice stones, are still used today uh, for traditional purposes, for, for marriages. So I've dwelt on yap stones for a fair bit because actually the way a yap stone works by transmitting ownership just by word of mouth through transactions is very similar to how Bitcoin works. We'll come back to that in a minute. Present day, many of you will have heard that currency most favoured by prisoners it used to be cigarettes. Prisoners of war in the Civil War used to exchange cigarettes. Now it's ramen, apparently. Who knew? <laughs> now, I said there are many, many problems with commodity currencies. 
many problems, and there's a reason we have to play. But there are some benefits that we have lost in our current monetary system. First one is the money supply is limited. If you're using gold, there's only so much gold, and it's quite hard to get to. And generally, the amount of money in circulation increases at a diminishing rate, and it controls inflation. The amount of money entering the economy is controlled by the physical lack of that money. Second of all, it encourages exploration. Now, this isn't actually an intention of currency, but if gold is valuable, then it makes absolutely perfect sense to have a gold rush. So in 19th century America, thousands of prospectors traveled across the country, set up the West Coast of America, and created gold mines, and that's the basis of where we've got Silicon Valley today, those settlements. And that's really important for Bitcoin. Bitcoin uses mining in a very similar way to encourage um, some very productive things to happen. So we'll go on to that a little later on this. And finally, commodity currencies are generally internationally accepted without any transaction fees. When Marco Polo traveled from the west to the east, he could pay people with gold wherever he went. He didn't need to exchange the currency. Gold was recognized everywhere. Same with salt. Maybe less so with ramen noodles, but in prisons it works. Now, none of us use commodity currencies anymore, or very little at least. And countries started getting rid of their gold standards some time ago. In Britain, we got rid of the gold standard in 1931. And a few decades after that, our old Prime Minister Gordon Brown decided to sell gold at an all-time low price. If you'd have travelled um, in the UK about six years ago during our general election, you'd have seen this poster by his... Um, by his political rivals, the Conservative Party, lambasting him for selling this gold so cheap. And instead of having that physical gold, what we have today, we've got banknotes, I've got one here, and on the banknote, on every banknote issued by the UK and by the Federal Reserve, there is a promise, it says on the British banknote, I promise to pay the bearer of this note on demand the sum of £10. And once upon a time, that meant I could go to the Bank of England give them my notes and they would give me an equivalent amount of gold. We don't have that anymore. The money itself is the value. So the Bank of England is making a promise to me that that is the value. The value of the currency is in law, it's in the British Constitution. That's where the value derives from. Nothing more than trust. And that's fine. It has some benefits. It means that government can control money supply uh, and it means that you can smooth out um, dips and recessions in the economy. However, I said there are two problems with big currencies. The first one is, what if you don't trust the government? And for many people in the world, Zimbabwe is a great example, there is a very good reason not to trust the government. This is a Zimbabwe $100 trillion note. These entered regular circulation, they were very common, and in fact, by the time they'd been delivered, they were almost worthless. They decided to print more currency of different denominations and by the time that currency arrived, they'd run out of money to pay for the ink. Yeah, this was a complete economic catastrophe. The government just printed money to pay people, caused hyperinflation, and by the end of this period, or actually halfway through, in July 20, uh, 2008, a monthly war pension, so the amount of pension that a war veteran would get in Zimbabwe every month, was 100 billion Zimbabwean dollars. So they would get 100 billion Zimbabwean dollars, which sounds great, but that was about 70 Oh, and by the way, because of hyperinflation, that would be worth 50 American cents a few weeks later. So you had to spend it pretty quick. If you wrote a check in Zimbabwe, you had to write a check for double the amount you were paying, because by the time that check cleared, it would be worth half as much. So fiat money has real problems where you don't trust governments. Fiat money also have pro has problems when you use it online. So <coughs> The first biggest problem of online transactions for merchants is chargeback. So if I buy something on Amazon and then I phone up my bank account and they say, that was a fraudulent transaction, I didn't make that, they charge the money back and someone has to bear that cost. And that single thing is why Bitcoin was first created. If you read the original paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, the, the creator of Bitcoin, that's the first paragraph. There is this problem of chargebacks, we're trying to solve it. But there are other problems that as well. There are transaction fees, there are currency conversion fees, transactions can be intercepted and taxed when you send money, and you can have online theft. And just to talk about how those fees add up, this is a surreal example of Indiegogo, if any of you will be familiar with it. Um, to transfer money to Indiegogo, it takes about 
percent transaction fee. You know, five percent is their fee, which some of which will be paid to handle your money and the, the transactions associated with that. And there's credit card fees and there's wire fees. This amount goes up. In fact, it goes up to about ten percent if you use PayPal. So transaction fees online are a huge problem. So, why is all of this relevant to Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin manages to take some of those benefits from commodity currencies and do away with inherent problems with fiat currencies like hyperinflation and makes it easier to transact online without the transaction fees or without chargebacks. So that's why Bitcoin exists. Next question I pose is how does Bitcoin work? Now, this part of the presentation is quite technical. Please, please feel free to ask any questions if anything is unclear. There is no such thing as a stupid question. Um, if anything is unclear, it is my fault, not yours, not understanding. So, how does Bitcoin work? At its heart, Bitcoin is really simple. There is this, this green box called a ledger. And a ledger is a list of all the Bitcoin users in the world and how many Bitcoins they've got. It's really simple, and I'll show you exactly how that works a little bit later. And if I want to make a transaction, so I want to send money to someone, that's really simple as well. All I do is I write out a transaction, and that is exactly what the transaction looks like. I'm Alice, I want to send Bob some money, I want to send him specifically 10 Bitcoins. And I send that transaction to the distribution network, and everyone updates their ledgers. And now everyone in the world knows that Bob has those 10 Bitcoins, I don't have them anymore. Sounds really simple. But, how does it work? There are problems here. How do you know that transaction is really from Alice? Anyone could have fraudulently created that transaction. Second of all, how do, you, how do you account for double spending? So what happens if Alice tries to pay two people at the same time with the same Bitcoin? How do you stop that happening? And actually, you know, fixing that problem means that if, if you didn't fix that problem, the ledgers could become out of sync. Those ledgers that cop network could look different. And finally, where do Bitcoins actually come from? What are they? So we're going to answer these three questions. Okay. So by the way, I'm going to tell you three lines in this segment. The first line, I've just told you. Remember I said the orange box was what a transaction looks like? That's not what a transaction looks like. The transaction actually has a little bit attached to the end, that yellow box at the end. And what that yellow box is, is it's a signature, a digital signature, that proves that Alice is the one sending that transaction. Okay? So when you send out a Bitcoin transaction, you say Alice is going to pay Bob 10 Bitcoin, and here is Alice's signature to prove this is really from Alice. How does that work? How do you get a di digital signature? I told you we're going to cover a lot of topics today. So cryptography 101. So the first thing you do when you create a Bitcoin wallet is you create what's called a public key and a private key. Now, I prefer to think of it as a public key and a private lock. And what those are is they're complementary numbers. They're two very, very long numbers. And you use your private lock to encrypt data. So it's an encryption algorithm in Bitcoin, and all you do is you give it the data you want to encrypt, like the transaction, and you say, here is my lock, encrypt it with that lock, and that data is locked. And the public key is the only way to unencrypt that data. So if you use the public key on data that's used on your private lock, it will decrypt it, and you'll get back to the original message. Okay? Now, crucially, that private lock is something you keep, you never share. It is a number, so you can write it down on paper, you can store it on a hard disk offline, you can store it on a shared online wallet if you, if you choose to, but that is something that is personal to you and only you know. The public key is known by everyone. The reason it's known by everyone is because that is basically your email address, your bank account number on Bitcoin. So when we say Alice is sending Bob money, actually, What's happening is an email address, a public key, is sending money to another public key. And in that way, Bitcoin is anonymous. No one knows who Alice is, no one knows who Bob, Bob is. All they see is one, one bank account sending money to another bank account. So let's just talk through that, because it's not the most intuitive thing if you haven't seen it before. So, Alice wants to send Bob 10 Bitcoins, so she creates that transaction message. She then uses the, uses the encryption algorithm with her private lock to lock that transaction and it 
brings this very long number, which we call the digital signature, and she sends that along with the transaction. <coughs> and I'm someone else on the Bitcoin network, and I want to check whether that was really Alice sending those Bitcoins. What I do is I take the signature, I decrypt it using the public key. Remember, the public key is just Alice's name, it's her email address, it's a bank account number. I just take it straight from that, and it should decrypt for that same transaction. If anyone has tampered with any of the code in this, if anyone has inserted bits into the, the, the transaction or into the signature, it will come out as garbage. Only that lock can unlock that key, and so only that key can unlock the lock. Only that lock can create messages that are unlocked by that key. Okay, there's a lot of mathematics behind this. Um, if you want to learn more, Google uh, elliptic curve cryptography. Really interesting area for the people that are mathematics as well. So, we've solved the problem of checking that transaction is real and that it's come from Alice. However, what we haven't checked is when Alice is sending those bitcoins, does she really own those bitcoins? So I said I'd tell you three lies in a second. So the second lie I told you was, <coughs> remember how I said a transaction looks like an orange box with a yellow signature? Actually, a transaction's a little bit more complex than that. This is actually, honestly, what a transaction looks like. So a transaction has three components. It has inputs. So Alice, in her transaction, she says, last week, Raj sent me six bitcoins. And the week before that, Chan, he sent me five bitcoins. So I've got these 11 bitcoins. What I want to do is I want to give 10 of those bitcoins to Bob, and there's one change, because I started with 11, I've moved it away, so I'll take that one change from me, so the one goes back to Alice, and those are the outputs. And here's the signature to prove it's me. Okay? Now, just three points to know about this. So first of all, the transaction, every transaction in Bitcoin, references previous transactions where the money has come from. Okay? Think back to that rice an example. When you're given a coin, a rye stone, you're told where it came from. You might not even know where that stone is, it might be at the bottom of the sea, but you know it's come from somewhere. The recipients of bitcoins are stated in the outputs. So here Bob is getting 10, Alice is getting 1. But more interestingly, the output, there's actually a scripting language in bitcoin. So you can make the outputs really complex. So instead of just saying I'm giving, I'm giving Bob 10 bitcoins, you can you can set it up so it's an escrow service. So I will give Bob 10 bitcoins, but only when someone else agrees to it. Uh, and you can write your own scripts for this. You can make it really, really complex. You can say, when two out of three parties agree that this money should be paid, then it will be paid. Um, it's quite risky to try and write these scriptures up. Once someone lost 2,500 bitcoins by writing the script wrong, those bitcoins are gone forever. That is about, I think, the current, uh, current level is about a million dollars worth of bitcoins has just disappeared. Right, so each transaction in the Bitcoin world references previous transactions. So when Alice sent 10 Bitcoins to Bob, it referenced a transaction that sent six Bitcoins from Raj to Alice. And that transaction referenced three Bitcoins going from Ali to Raj and three Bitcoins going from Shola to Raj. And those transactions referenced earlier and earlier and earlier transactions, all the way back to the beginning of Bitcoin. Create this transaction tree. So every transaction and that is what the ledger is. So remember we said there's a distributed ledger around the world that everyone's got? What the ledger contains is the list of every transaction that has ever happened with Bitcoin in the history of Bitcoin. About 20 million uh, transactions on that ledger, the ledger is roughly the last time I checked. Now, this has some really interesting implications. First of all, Bitcoins only exist on the ledger. So think about that rice stone at the bottom of the sea might as well not exist. Bitcoins don't exist. Bitcoins are not bits of code, Bitcoins are not physical objects. Bitcoins only exist because there is a transaction chain showing how a Bitcoin has moved from person to person. You're going to ask, so where did the Bitcoin come from to start with? Where did that transaction begin? We'll come on to that when we talk about mining. Second thing is, while everyone on Bitcoin, if they choose to remain so anonymous, every single transaction 
every single transaction ever made by Bitcoin is on a public ledger that anyone can see. And that has some really interesting implications. There have been some occasions where, where research scientists have looked at the list of transactions and you can spot patterns. You spot this person keeps getting lots of small payments in and they keep giving it to that person's Bitcoin wallet. You know, and you see behaviors emerging. It's quite, quite interesting science. Okay, so if you want to go into Bitcoin, the first thing you do is you download that latest transaction ledger. And here's the thing, in Bitcoin you trust no one. There is no trust in central government and central monetary authority. So the first thing you do when you download that transaction ledger is you check every single transaction to make sure the signature matches the public key being referenced in that transaction and make sure the transactions are real. And you check all 20 million back to day zero. And at the moment that takes over 24 hours to do. And when you get a new transaction, there are two things you must do. You must check that the signature matches the sender. So it's a real transaction, it's not a fraudulent transaction. But the second thing you must do is check that the inputs to that transaction haven't been spent in a previous transaction. So we saw earlier that Alice was trying to spend the coins that Raj and that Shola had given her. You need to check that those transactions haven't been used as an input for an earlier transaction, i.e. the Bitcoin hasn't been spent before. And in theory, you need to check all two million transactions. Actually, it's a bit quicker than that. What you do is you index all the unspent transactions and you do it quite quickly. Finally, working out your own Bitcoin balance is actually quite interesting. What you need to do is go through all two million transactions, look for any transactions where you have been given Bitcoin, and make sure those transactions haven't been spent by you at a later date, and add all of them up, and that, that's your balance. It's not easy to get to, right? Very, very difficult. Now, I said I'd tell you three lies. There's a slight lie. That's not actually what the ledger looks like. The ledger is slightly more complex than that. The ledger is split up into blocks. Okay? So instead of just having one really long list of transactions, you split the transactions into blocks. And here we've got block one, block two, block three. Now, there's a reason you do that. I'll give you a quick explanation now, and then I'll show you an example of it on the next slide. The reason you do that is, imagine you just have a ledger that was a list of transactions. And people are firing transactions left, right, and center, and different parts of the world, different networks, are getting those transactions in different orders. So if I try and spend money on one transaction over here, and I try and spend that same Bitcoin on another transaction over here, the ledgers are gonna fall out of sync, and that will be a huge problem. Ledgers have to be in sync. And to fix that, we use blocks. Each block contains three bits of information. First of all, it links to the last block. So, I've got block number three there, and it says the last block before me was block number two, and that says the last block before me is block number one. That's a chain, and this is why it's called the blockchain. The blocks chain together, and they create an order. Second thing you've got is you've got the transactions that form part of that block, so a list of transactions. And finally, you've got this really odd thing called a nonce. A nonce is a random number. We'll talk about why the nonce is in there in a couple of slides time. But let's go back to the question, why, why would we split down the transaction list into blocks? How does that fix the double spending problem? So imagine Alice is trying to commit fraud. So she <coughs> wants to pay Bob with 10 bitcoins in America, and she wants to pay Bert in Australia with 10 bitcoins, and she sends out both transactions both have the same sets of inputs. She's trying to double spend the money. So the question is, we've got our three blocks there. Which transaction goes into the fourth block? Does Bob get that money, or does Bert get that money? Well, as a starter, all of those new transactions 